Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon Mystery Baking Murder episode. We're on the moon. Well, I guess we're not on the moon. We're in outer space. Okay, look at it. What do you think about it? Do you feel like you're in space? Do you feel like you're part of NASA? Because that's how I feel. I feel like this was a NASA level production. I'm just kidding. It wasn't. Most of the stuff is like hot glued on. Don't look too closely. Don't zoom in. That's very f***ing rude. Anyway, welcome to today's Bacon Mystery episode. Listen, I'm so excited because today we are covering the book Shatter Me. I have gotten, th the amount of requests that I've gotten for the Shatter Me series is out of this world, astronomical. I mean, even every time I go on TikTok, my whole For You page is all about Aaron Warner. And I'm like, what's going on right now? The stars are just aligned. The moon is not a star, forget it. Am I just destined to read this series? And I'm not gonna lie, before I was going into it, I had incredibly high hopes for this series. And there's a lot that I like about the series, but I do have a couple of pickles about the series as well. But I do hear that it gets better as the series goes on. Everyone was like, disregard the first book. Read the first book to get into the story, get the context, but the second book, that's where it all hits you. So. What does that even mean, okay? okay? I don't know, but I'm gonna leave the links for Shatter Me in the description as well as the author's page. I am gonna give the second book a read. Listen, this is, um, I'm gonna leave my opinions at the end, but it's good, okay? We're doing the Shatter Me, so I'm gonna get into it with my little marshmallow flowers. And let's talk about the world that is inside of this series. It's called, um, I don't know what the world is called, but I do know that there is this huge government entity called the reestablishment. So if you guys don't know, Shatter Me is this YA dystopian fantasy romance series. And you're gonna have a lot of like Hunger Games aspects to it. There's even like an Akatar aspect. This was published in 2011, so this is a while back. This is like when dystopian books were the shit. Like you know how romance and smut are the shit right now? They've always been the shit, but they're like really hyped right now. Dystopian books. Oh man, mm. oh man, people were eating it up. They were like, I wanna live in a world like that. Well, welcome to 2023 where it is a world like that. Anyway, there's a government entity called the reestablishment. Think Hunger Games, think like 2040 vibes. The world has been stripped of all the natural resources. The humans have literally sucked earth dry of all the resources of what it once was. Animals are dead. There's no birds because of the pollution. There's no food. All the food is polluted. The, the livestock, they're all poisoned by the polluted soil. They're all dropping dead. Humans are basically resorting to sometimes even cannibalism just to survive. People <sighs> are starving. They're eating humans? Okay, that's like very rare. But they're oh. like even eating the polluted animals, the poisoned animals. Oh. It's crazy. Huh. Crime is commonplace. Everyone just seemed really at a loss of what to do in this world and in comes the reestablishment. That's what they're called. Maybe at one point in the very beginning, maybe the reestablishment wanted to do something good for the world. They made a lot of promises to the vulnerable masses. They were like, hey humans, calm the f down. I promise you salvation from this dying world, from this dying society. We got you, we got plans. We got plans for days. Look at our little book. That sounds like a cult, but look at our little book, okay? And once they got in power, once they established themselves, the reestablishment, all they did was exploit the population. For the top people in power, they were benefiting. They were living in luxury, living in marble coated floors of mansions, and they killed anyone that stood in their way or even lightly questioned their methods. So the reestablishment since then, global. They've gone global. They control the entire world. Countries no longer exist. Hmm. So all of the country powers have been taken down and instead all of the inhabitable land left in the world has been divided into 3,333 sectors. Okay. And each sector has a person in power. So think like a president of that sector, but they all report to the reestablishment. So it's not like a bunch of presidents that are mingling and like having these power dynamics. Mm -hmm. They all have the same boss. Mm. But the 3,000 yeah. lands, are they all equal or do they have different ranks too? They're all equal, it seems. Okay, okay, can I just tell you something? Can I just tell you something? The world building on this one was a little weak, okay? Mm. Like you're confused. Like I don't know what's going on, okay? <laughs> I am just reporting to you what I know from the news. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I can't tell you that I'm an expert in this because mm -hmm. maybe it gets better in the next couple of books but I don't know compared to some of the other like dystopian books I've read the world building definitely didn't suck me in I didn't really understand the gravity of how bad this current world situation was it was just very like hee hee there's no food anymore hee hee ha ha bye so I'm like okay 
Okay, okay. Okay. So in order to ensure the people of power stay in power, the population has been relocated. So you know how right now everybody lives in suburbs or they live in these apartment complexes or these metro hubs. That's back then. Gone. That's gone. They're all abandoned structures now. Everyone has been relocated to these massive, gated, guarded compounds where you do everything there. You work for the reestablishment. You wait for your meager food rations, rations to show up. They just drop you off like little packets of microwavable food. You go to school there. Everything is inside of this grim, gray, dark compound. There isn't public transportation because where the you go in okay you get your food inside of there you get your school aka propaganda in there like you don't need any of that if you have a car you're like high up in the re-establishment if you have freedom and you can go outside the compound you're pretty high up in the re-establishment so everything is in one place and you're basically a lab rat you're being used you're nothing but a number to help the re-establishment human civilization as we know it Gone. Finito. Everyone is forced to work, to produce for the reestablishment, and the minute that you are useless, sk- if you're sick, you're dead. If you're on prescription meds, you're dead. It's like a thing, okay? The reestablishment preached about creating a new generation comprised of only healthy individuals. So if you take prescription meds, you can kiss your antidepressants goodbye! Yeah, you don't get them anymore. So if you catch the illness, you're dead? Yeah, basically. They're like, that sucks for you. And you're like, it's just the flu. You really don't have to execute me. But they'll probably execute you. It's crazy, okay? They think the sick should die. The old should die. The mentally ill should be locked in an asylum where they too will die. Only the strong and the fit will survive. There's no holidays, no religions, no individuality, like nothing. This is the world that we're kind of being thrown into, right? Now, the main character, her name is Juliet. Got something to say about Juliet, but I don't know if I should say it at the end or if I should say it now. Listen, I'm so scared. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Juliet has been locked in an insane asylum for the past 264 days. I'm making marshmallow flower meringue cookies. I'm kind of excited. So you get these like pink and white mushrooms. They're not that bouncy. Mushrooms? (laughs) Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Marshmallows. Cut cut it four times. So start with the middle, maybe. Uh Oh, Uh -oh. whoa, that's not gonna be four. And then you just force it open like this. But I need to cut it um more. Um, What's going on? eh? It's supposed to be a beautiful flower. It looks like a starfish. It's a pretty simple (laughs) instruction, I see. No, no, no. Let me retry. Okay, because that's that's weird. (laughs) No, it looks like a starfish. (laughs) It looks like Patrick. It looks like Patrick Star. <laughs> this is not Jerry Blossom. Keep doing that. I think I need some water. No, no, no. You don't no. need water. That's sticky and nasty. Okay, you're always sticky and nasty. Are we flirting right now? I feel like we're flirting. <laughs> I need to get into Juliet. She's in an insane asylum. Do you want her to get out or no? Yes. Okay, so she's been trapped in an insane asylum for 264 days. It's honestly a bit more like a prison cell than anything. That's what the reestablishment did to people like her. They throw her in these white vans, they drive her 6 hours and 37 minutes, and then they throw her into a cell. Her parents didn't even want to stop them. They wanted this. That's the hard part to swallow for Juliet. Like, she knows that her parents wanted her to be locked up in here. She's in complete isolation. She's been in solitude for 264 days. The only thing that's there to keep her from losing her freaking mind was this small little notebook and this broken pen that she has. Which, side note, her notebook is filled with lines of her writing, I am not insane, and then crossing it out. That's arguably very unhinged behavior, but it's fine. We forgive the main character on this one. It has been exactly 6,336 hours since she's even spoken a word. And it's been way longer since she's even touched a human being. You might be wondering, why is Juliet in this insane asylum? Were you wondering that? Thank you very Mm -hmm. much. Okay, why does anyone ever get thrown into an insane asylum? She killed someone, of course. That's probably why they were keeping her in solitude. Maybe they were scared that she would do it again. Of course she would never do it again. She's our main lead. She didn't mean to kill the little boy. It was an accident. It was purely an accident, okay? Nobody believed her. So it kind of came as a surprise when they told Juliet that she was going to be getting a new roommate. Juliet can only form one logical conclusion from this. Her cellmate, her new roommate, must be scarier, must be more dangerous than her. Otherwise, why would they put them together? So she's waiting in her little cell anxiously for her new little roommate to show up. And she pra- she's practicing talking. 
She's surprised to see that she still knows how to speak. Her voice box hurts a little bit. It felt foreign because it's been almost a year, but she could still do it. Either way, she's more surprised when she learns that her new roommate is a boy. Maybe the guards are trying to kill her or kill him because if he were to touch her, she would literally kill him. We later learn that this new roommate's name is Adam. Adam is the definition of a hot guy. Like this is YA dystopian and in the author's defense it was published in 2011. So all the characters are gonna be super, 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 super hot. Like Bella Hadid fucking level hot. Adam's arms are tattooed. He's got these dark blue eyes. It's like brownish hair. Sharp jawline that could cut cheese like butter. I guess cheese is pretty easy to cut. He's got like these overly ripped bods. You know, that's all to say. He's very sexy. Thankfully, there's two small beds in the cell on opposite ends of the cell. So he's going to be very far away from her. But the very first night he gets there, it's like he's trying to assert his dominance or something. Adam shoves the two beds together, takes both pillows and blankets for himself. And out of fear and anger, Juliet ends up sleeping on the ground that night. <laughs> wait, wait. The dude moves in and <laughs> yeah. he's like, give me your bed. Basically, yeah. The <laughs> Why? dude is... Uh, because he, he's a king and he needs a king-sized bed. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I don't know why he's making enemies on the first day. He's asserting his little dominance. Maybe he's insane. Who knows, okay? Wait, what about the, so the main girl. Yeah. She's hot. Oh, she's hot. But she, like, doesn't know she's hot. Uh, she's, like, really insecure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because that's the thing. We got to teach our young girls that if you're hot, you can't know it. You can never know it. It's actually a crime. People will fucking kill you if you think you're hot. Anyway, what was that rant for? <laughs> anyway, so she's on the ground with nothing, just freezing. She's too paranoid, too scared to do anything about it. And from the get-go, Adam seems kind of like a dick. Juliet is curled up on the floor, and he's taken up both the beds, and his first words to his new cellmate basically are, so, are you crazy or something? Like, is that why you're in here? She doesn't respond. You know I'm not gonna hurt you. More silence. What's your name? Juliet doesn't answer. Instead, she tries her best to stay awake all night so that he can't try anything with her. The next few days are a blur of like power struggles. Adam keeps trying to get Juliet to talk to him, to tell him her name, but she refuses. First, she wants to know why he's even in here, but he refuses to answer that question. So both of them are like, I'm not gonna answer your question unless you answer my question, and he keeps going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All they do is wait for their little sporadic meals to be shoved in through the hole in the door, and they hope that they won't have to starve. That's the thing about this insane asylum. If you were not crazy when you came in, you're gonna be crazy on your way out. They wanna starve you. They give you no routine, no food schedule, so you completely lose your mind. I mean, you're basically starving. You lose all the fat on your bones. You're gonna go mad after a little while in here. Even Juliet thinks Adam's gonna go mad soon. I mean, how can you not when all you hear every single night in the pitch darkness are screams coming from all the other cells? Nobody talks to you, nobody looks at you. Even shower time is just this giant bell ringing, the loud clink of all the cells being unlocked. They keep the lights off for some reason. You have to fight your way to find the bathroom in the pitch darkness. You scavenge for a piece of soap on the ground that's been left behind, and you shower in cold water for two minutes before you run back to your cell in pitch darkness. You don't even have a towel, so you gotta be careful not to get too wet in the shower, otherwise you die of hypothermia. I don't know why they do that. So okay? just a bunch of naked people running in the dark? Yes! <laughs> I don't know if it's like a party, or if it's like dystopia. I don't know, okay? They just want to mess with you. They want to laugh at you. They want you to fend for yourself out there. So what? You could just wash the gunk off of you? It's confusing, but it's enough to drive anybody mad, including Adam. And for some reason, the idea of her cellmate losing his mind makes her a little bit sad. Okay, so side note about Juliet, if you're wondering why she's so cautious of Adam. I mean, she has no idea why he's in the insane asylum. Even though she's a killer, he could be one too. He could be worse, right? We don't know. But also, Juliet just has no trust in anybody. And it all stems from childhood trauma, parental trauma. Her parents hate her. They never treated her like she was human. Anytime Juliet showed any semblance of emotions, they were in disbelief. They refused to believe that Juliet could be human. One time she stole food to give it to like a stray cat. They refused to believe her. They literally felt like she could not care for something like a stray cat. They labeled her a thief on top of everything else, and they just, look, they really didn't love her. They were just shitty parents overall. They refused to even touch her. They were scared of their own daughter. 
But how can Juliet even blame them? Even thinking about it in her cell, Juliet feels so desperate to be touched, like human touch, like skin to skin contact. She hasn't felt that in years. And even if someone were to touch her, a guard or Adam, it's not that simple. Everyone she touches dies. That's like her little superpower. Everyone she touches dies. Like a curse? Yes, they die. So she's a woman that cannot be touched, Literally. but she craves some physical yeah. contact. Yeah, yeah, she just wants wow. a yeah forbidden contact. Exactly, skinship oh. is what Koreans call it. Skinship. Skinship. That's what she's craving. Okay, she doesn't even remember how or when this started, or more importantly, why the. F it started. All she remembers is her mom screaming and her dad screaming. Everyone was screaming at her basically to be fucking grateful that she hasn't been thrown out on the street. She should be grateful that she was being treated like a human being when in fact she's a monster. That's what they were saying to her. Her parents were heartless. When they realized what was going on with Juliet, they refused to touch her. They blamed her for ruining their life. They even had this measuring stick that they would use to make sure Juliet never got too close to them. Like these are her own parents. And for the longest time, and probably even now, Julia just wanted to overcompensate. She felt like, okay, you know what? My parents hate me, but if I keep trying, if I keep being a better daughter, maybe they'll accept me even through my condition, my flaw, my disease. Like, that's what she calls it. But no doctor, no scientist, like, nobody knew what the hell was wrong with her. In fact, they didn't even want to know. It's like they just called her a devil, possessed, cursed monster. Go over there. That's what they said. So, her life has been hard. And the reason she's in here is because she touched a little boy. The boy had fallen down in a grocery store, and out of a quick moment without thinking, Juliet ran to him and was trying to get him, help him get back up. She killed him. Yeah. Like how though? I don't get it. So every time she touches someone, they can't let go. So even if you touch her, she has to be the one to break contact, uh -huh. and she literally drains the life out of them. Here's my pickle about this book, and maybe it gets better in the second book or the whole series, we really don't get much context to this. Like, we don't get much context like to why how, is she having this? yes, or why, or really much at all. Okay, okay. And then also, kind of, I, I did have some qualms about the loophole. Basically, the loophole is you just have to wear latex gloves when you touch her, and you'll be fine. Oh, that's, that's, oh, okay. Yeah, or you can like touch her through her shirt. There just has to be a piece of fabric or something between you two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's not that bad. Yeah, so like just get a pair of boxing gloves. That is her disease. That's her issue. I don't know. Julia considers herself a monster. She's really hard on herself. She's got some raging self-esteem issues. And her cellmate, Adam, seems to have no clue. He just like touches her through her shirt. I mean, he doesn't like grope her, but he's like, hey, come over here. And he'll like grab her shoulder where there's a piece of cloth, right? Or he'll like grab the hem of her shirt. I don't know, it's crazy. Yeah, anyway, the longer she keeps looking at Adam, the more she feels like she knows him. There was this kid that she knew before she killed another kid, okay? They were like eight years old. But there's no way, there's no way that's Adam. Like, that's crazy, okay? The kid that she knew would never end up in an insane asylum. But Adam just looks so familiar. Like, he has the same eyes as the guy that she used to know, the only friend she had in her whole life. The only thing is, the only friend that she had in her whole life, she never talked to him. She didn't even know his name. But he was the only one that ever stood up for her. So like kids in class, they would throw rocks at her because she was a freak and he would punch them. They never talked, but he was the only one that treated her like a human. And he just looks so similar to Adam. There's like no way, right? Anyway, she's like trying not to think about it. And this is how the first few nights of being with Adam go. Them being cryptic, not telling each other why they're in here, Adam getting dangerously close to Juliet without even knowing how close to death he is each time. All he had to do was touch her skin and he would be as good as dead. Juliet was way too scared to warn him though. Like the idea of another person being so deathly afraid of her made her stomach hurt. Okay, why? It's written in first person. It's just a lot of like, I feel, I feel. I'm like hurting people. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to hurt anyone. <laughs> I'm like, bitch, I'm in my girl power era, like hurt someone. <laughs> hurt that boy, who cares? <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. Instead, now they're sharing the bed. They put a pillow in between them and it's all fine and dandy until Juliet wakes up screaming one night. Another nightmare. Which side note, Adam tries to comfort her and I guess he like is his quick nunchi because he realizes Juliet doesn't need someone to baby her. So he just nonchalantly says, the screams in here never stop, do they? 
She says, no, no, they do not. Every night, the halls are filled with screams, okay? Just like, think of your stereotypical insane asylum. It's all in here. It's all in here. It's like half the book. It's half the book, okay? Anyway. But they don't get out. They were stuck in there. <laughs> I mean, they do get out, but it's a long time that they're in there oh for. God. And I'm like waiting for something to happen. I'm thinking like, orange is the new black. Thinking superstitions, paranormal activities, mm -hmm. prison break. Uh -huh, but instead? A hot guy, a hot guy comes in and is like, you, come with me, <laughs> basically. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're getting ahead of ourselves. We're going to Korea this month, okay? And I say this every time I have to stay at a hotel. Look, I ride or die for a continental breakfast. I do, okay? Those are my favorites. I like coming in and my towels are folded, but I hate sleeping on a new mattress, which is wild because everyone that I talk to, they're like, what? I sleep so much better at a hotel. Their mattresses are super fancy. I'm like, do you have a Helix Sleep mattress? Because my Helix Sleep mattress feels like a cloud, but not like really a cloud because I like a firm, like a slightly firm, like a firm cloud. A cloud that was molded and shaped for my body. It's out of this world. Okay, so Helix Sleep provides premium mattresses customized to fit your needs, and it's all conveniently shipped straight to your door. So you take the Helix Sleep quiz. It matches you with your perfect mattress based on your body type, your sleep preferences. I was matched with the Helix Midnight Lux. I love it. I've had it for like three and a half years, like since I was in LA. It is the perfect amount of firmness. And I'm a heavy, strong side sleeper. I will not fall asleep unless I'm on my side. This mattress provides so much support, I don't wake up aching. And it's super easy. You get paired with your mattress, Helix will deliver it to your door with free shipping in the US. It's so easy to set up, it's rolled up in a box, just unroll it. And the best part is, okay, well the best part is sleeping on the mattress, but the second best part is, you get a 100 night sleep trial to test the mattress and make sure that you love it. And Helix even has a 10 year warranty. They offer financing options and flexible payment plans. So make sure to visit helixsleep.com slash missmangobutt to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. That's helixsleep.com slash missmangobutt to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. So the two are staring at each other and they just, they share their first genuine smile. And Juliet hasn't smiled in 265 days. <laughs> Shut the front door. I'm being serious. She tells us that, okay? And Adam notices that Juliet is shivering and he brings the blanket over and, and rapidly wraps it tightly around her. Which, side note, if this is your first BAM that you're watching of us, like, trust me, I eat this up usually for a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, I'm a trope queen. I love tropes. I love cringy romance. I love Akatar. I love all of these freaking series. But this one was really doing it. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It's a lot. It's a lot. Like, you really have to have a stomach for tropes. And I think that I have a pretty steel stomach for tropes. In fact, I enjoy tropes. But they were playing a dangerous game. <laughs> Stop. Fucking be serious right now. Because one touch. It's all it One takes. Touch is all it takes. <laughs> so the next morning, the two start talking about the world, about life and their lives before the, before the asylum. And Juliet's biggest dream, literally her only dream that she has at night when she's not having nightmares, is to see a bird fly. Birds don't really exist anymore with the desecration of the planet. So all she wants to see is a bird fly. That's it. But she doesn't tell him that. You know, she's trying to be cryptic. She still doesn't know if she fully trusts Adam. She frequently finds the guy staring at her, which would be creepy, but because he's hot, you know, pass. The two of them sit staring out the window and Juliet asks what she's been dying to know. What's it like outside? Honestly, I don't know if being in here is necessarily a punishment at this point. So side note, Juliet has been in this particular asylum for almost a year, right? But she's been taken away by the reestablishment years ago, like three years to be exact. So she has no idea what the world has come to in the past three years. She has no idea what's going on out there, what her parents are up to, she knows nothing. Adam tells her most of what she already expected. The world's gonna sh things are only getting worse. He said that the reestablishment is trying to go into war soon. What war? There's rebels. The reestablishment is finding it too difficult to root itself across international societies. So they're retaliating against the rebels. They're out there destroying everything. The reestablishment wants to destroy every single book, every single artifact. They're trying to rewrite history and they're shameless about it. They tell everyone that it's the only way to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes as the previous generations. They're trying to control us. Not only that, but they want to destroy English, the English language. 
as well as all other languages. So what do they speak? <laughs> They're gonna make a new language that's universal. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and they want to control the language. Yeah. Juliet feels tears pooling in her eyes. Cause she likes to journal, you know? It's, it's like her beautiful words are gonna be illegal one day. Uh, you know okay. what I mean? Juliet wants to cry, but she tries to distract herself with the new plate of sludge that's been passed in through the door. And like this, this happens for like two weeks, okay? Two weeks, coexisting with a roommate. Juliet's trying to convince herself that this is not the guy that she used to know. Whenever she thinks of the guy she used to know, she digs out her little notebook and she's trying to distract herself. Because the only thing more heartbreaking than knowing that that little boy she used to know ended up in an insane asylum is knowing that he doesn't even recognize her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at one point, Adam comes over and is like trying to comfort Juliet because she seems emotional. And she's like, you can't, you can't touch me. And he's like, why not? I'm not going to hurt you, please. And she's like, you don't even know me. He's like, no, you don't know me. You think you do, but you don't. And who knows? Maybe I'm crazy. He's like, I know you're not crazy, Juliet. Yeah, well then maybe you're crazy. Maybe one of us is crazy. Tell me why you're in here then, Adam. What are you doing in an insane asylum if you don't belong here, huh? I've been asking you the same question every single day, Juliet, but you don't answer me. And she's like, just, just don't touch me, okay? And instead of using critical thinking skills, Adam assumes that Juliet doesn't want him to touch her because she's disgusted by him. So Juliet is now trying to comfort him and tell him that he has no idea what he's talking about. And she's trying to look at him and she says, you know, it's not, it's not you. And that's when she realized and it clicks. She knows without a shadow of doubt that it's him. It's him from the past. She would recognize those blue eyes anywhere. She would never forget them. The last time that she had seen them was three years ago before she was taken. She would never forget Adam, but it seems, it seems like Adam had forgotten her. For a few days, neither of them talk anymore because of that little fight. Maybe it's for the best, but on one day, who knows how many days it's been, they lost count. The cell door is unlocked and five guards with rifles come in, swarming the cramped cell. They're screaming, barking orders at the two. Hands up, feet apart, mouth shut, don't move or we shoot you. Julia doesn't process this fast enough because the next thing she feels is the butt of the gun going into her back and her knees crack on the hard floor. She forces herself up and she's stumbling, wondering if she should even follow the orders. She knows that they're gonna kill her anyway. That's what they're probably doing. Finally, they realize there's no way to help her. There's no fixing her, no cure. So they're gonna get rid of her. And then boom, another powerful blow. Juliet would be out for two full days before she woke up. Almost like the past few weeks with Adam never happened. She wakes up in a cell completely alone. She's worried about Adam and she's thinking, is he dead? Is he in a cell next to me? Like what the hell is going on? She looks out the small window of her cell and there's these two guards standing there with their rifles across their chest. When they notice that Juliet is awake, they come in, they point their rifles at her and they make her follow, her to, they make her follow them to a new room. She notices that all the guards all had tattoos. Okay. Oh, just like that dude, Adam. And she's what like, kind of oh no, like a sleeve. Okay. Like a sleeve. See hot slave, okay? And Juliet looks up, and there he was, in full uniform. Adam is a guard. I'm so confused. Yeah, what he happened? he was a he was a decoy. He came in there pretending to be a cellmate, but he's actually a guard. He was an undercover? Undercover agent. So what Adam looks up to her, points a gun at her chest, and there's like no recognition in his eyes. The warmth that used to be there, it's all gone. Adam was a soldier for the reestablishment. Which means, Juliet doesn't even realize she's been led to a new room where the lights are so bright. She's like being blinded. Her eyes are having a hard time readjusting. She hears this effortlessly powerful voice ring through the room. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. This is finally a character that I'm kind of into. Like, kind of like, okay? And he's like, dim the lights and release her. I wanna see her face. Juliet squints and she looks up to see a young man, like no older than her. Because, you know. I'm How old are they? 17. Shut the front door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my problem. Age. That's my problem with Six of Crows too. I think I'm just too old. I think I'm too old and like I just always ignore the age. I ignore the age. You're telling me you're an assassin, you're killing people, you're doing this. 
and your voice is cracking? <laughs> like, you're in puberty right now? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> it's obvious though, that they have different lives, okay? He's oozing confidence, his power, like his skin is flawless, he's impeccably dressed in suits, his jawline is sharp and strong, his eyes are the palest shade of emerald that she had ever seen, and oh my god, like this man is fucking beautiful, but in like a very scary way. Like Adam is like boy next door beautiful, mm -hmm. but this guy is scary beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like beautifully evil is how he looks. Mm -hmm. Even the way he's smirking at her right now. Sparking. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. And his suit doesn't have a wrinkle in sight. The way he commands the soldiers to do what, whatever he wants, honestly. Like he's got some sort of unparalleled power here. But like how and why at this age, okay? <laughs> and he's like, I hear you didn't even want to play nice with your cellmate, Juliet. He knows her name. Juliet glances over to Adam, who doesn't even look guilty for betraying her. And he says, Kent, step forward. So his last name is Kent, Adam Kent. Mm -hmm. Adam steps forward and he explains. And he gives a nod. Juliet had heard of people like Adam. So there are a lot of reestablishment soldiers that are sent to live amongst the people, pretending to be one of them, reporting anything and anyone that was remotely suspicious. Every day, because of these undercover agents, people would disappear and never come back. Juliet stares at Adam and then blurts out to the man in front of her, which we later found out his name, his last name is Warner. Are you going to kill me? The guy smiles, waits for her to lift her head. She looks at him and he says, Juliet, I have a proposition for you. You have something I want. I can admit I've studied you for a while, your records. I've poured over them with, it's almost become an, an obsession, honestly. My records? What? Juliet, we're in the middle of a war. Maybe you can connect some dots. I don't... We're playing naive, I see. I know your little secret, Juliet. I know why you were thrown in an insane asylum. I know why your entire life is documented in hospital records, all the lawsuits, police reports. I know it all. And I've been thinking about you for a very long time. Thinking about how you can be a part of our initiative. I just wanted to make sure that you weren't actually insane first. Isolation tends to break people, but I see that you weren't volatile. You were capable of basic human interaction, and I'm quite impressed with Adam and how he was able to elicit such emotions from you. Which I guess here's a formal introduction, Juliet. Meet Adam Kent, one of the best soldiers on base. But don't worry, I haven't told him what you're capable of quite yet. Juliet looks down. She can't even like bring herself to look Adam in the face. Adam doesn't even react. To him, she was just a job, like another mission for his great cause, the reestablishment. She wants to fucking gag. She has no idea why this betrayal is even hitting her so deep. Listen, I have no idea why it's hitting her so deep, but like, <laughs> here we are, okay? You, okay, can I just give a little mini thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the problem was, it feels I think books are better than movies because movies don't have enough time to get into the characters. And so you kind of have, at least most movies, like really good ones obviously do, but you have a character, you know their quirks, you know their likes, their little caricature, and then you know their mission or motivation in life. But that's about it in movies. But yeah. then in books, it goes so in depth, they mm -hmm. go into all the layers. But this feels like a dystopian show. Mm -hmm. And I'm surface. just watching episode one. Yeah. You just see it, but you don't feel it. Like, I see everyone, they're like saying these things, like I get it, the reestablishment, but I don't yeah. see like a ton of um, layers yet. Yeah, yeah. But I hear this is literally one of the weaker of the series, like this book. Anyway, the guy in front of her asks her to join his team, fight with him in the war. He can change her life, make sure she never gets bullied, never gets thrown and locked in a cell ever again. He can help her see her true potential. And Juliet's like, well, what happens if I don't accept? You don't really have a choice, Juliet. If you stand with me, you'll be rewarded. But if you disobey, well, I think you look rather lovely with all your body parts intact, don't you? So you want me to torture people for you? Like that's what you want? Well, if you're offering, yes, that'd be wonderful. The man throws Adam a pair of gloves and orders Adam to drag her to her room. Juliet tries to fight back, but she's just screaming, I'm never gonna join the reestablishment. Just kill me because I will never join you. And before she leaves, Warner says, My dear, it would be a shame to lose such a pretty face. Take her to her room. And Juliet, don't struggle. You're only making things difficult for yourself. So Adam hoists Juliet up while she's kicking and screaming, and she screams one final, I hope you rot in hell, at the man before she's dragged out of the room. Juliet probably would have continued kicking and screaming 
if she wasn't hit with a sight that she would have never imagined to see in a million years. A sight dripping of luxury and privilege. Okay, she knows what this is. It's political headquarters for someone like the person in power for the area. So we can expect that Warner is like a person in power. One of the 3,333 persons in power, right? There's fancy furniture. Persian rugs, artificial heat, chandeliers, waste, just so much waste, marble floors. So many people have died in order for this to be created. People are dying out there. The world is ending. Through, She's in Warner's house, basically. Oh, through the house, I see. It's basically corruption, right? And Juliet is even more disgusted by the man that led her here. Both the man that wanted her to join him, Warner, and Adam. She just sees red everywhere. The carpets, the marble, the chandeliers. She just wants to throw up. Adam finally heads her to the door at the end of the hall, opens it up with a key card, and the giant massive stainless steel doors unlocks with heavy clinks, and inside there's this queen-size bed. Lush carpets, massive closet filled to the brim with clothes that are in her size, so it looks like they've been waiting for her. There's fresh flowers. She hasn't seen fresh flowers in years, and it's honestly so beautiful, and she hates it. She hates it because people died for the reestablishment to gain this level of power and money. And she's like, can you just leave me alone, please? Adam looks at her, and he seems to look softer. Like, he seems to look like the guy that was in the prison cell with her. And he says, I don't really have a choice, Juliet. I have to watch over you. It's my order. Warner has made you my assignment, and I can't leave. You have to stay here? His silence is confirmation, and Juliet wants to kill him. Like, how did he go from being the kindest person she ever knew in her childhood to this, a soldier for the reestablishment? He leads her to the bathroom and tells her to get dressed. He mentions that this is the only place in the room that doesn't have cameras. And she's thinking like, of course her f***ing room has cameras, of f***ing course it does. He tells her that Warner is expecting her for dinner. She's like, dinner? He's not gonna kill me? He wants me to have dinner with him? So Juliet showers a hot shower for once and is sat down in front of her massive closet by Adam and he tells her to wear the purple dress, but she refuses because everything in there is silk and other expensive materials that she's never actually been able to touch and she refuses to wear silk when people are dying. Mm. <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. She hates it. She just wants her old raggedy clothes. She pretends like she's gonna wear the purple dress, but she slips on her old insane asylum clothes when Adam turns around. She's pissed. You know, she's thinking to herself, these people, they think that they can shower me, literally, and then give me a few cute dresses, and I'm gonna abandon my morals and bend over backwards for the reestablishment? I don't think so. She protests wearing any of the clothes in the closet, walks out of the room with Adam chasing after her, and Juliet hopes that Warner will be disappointed with her outfit. She hopes that she will disappoint him in every way possible. So she plops down at the dinner table where Warren is staring at her, already seated, and all the guards are looking at her like they're very shocked. You know, Juliet, there are clothes in your closet. You don't have to wear the dirty rags anymore. I like my clothes. Thank you very much. Are you hungry? He's smiling at her, but all she wants to do is rip his eyeballs out. He's got this little fake smile, his fake sweet voice. He's despicable. I'm not hungry. Juliet, don't confuse stupidity for bravery. I know you haven't eaten in days. Juliet smiles, and in the same sickly sweet voice of Warner's, she says loudly in front of all the guards, including Adam, I would rather die than eat your food and listen to you. <laughs> the whole room goes silent. Warner's face changes from like this polite, curt smile to an icy gaze, and he stares at Juliet for what feels like 10 hours before pulling out his gun and shooting it randomly into thin air. He didn't even look. He could have literally killed a guard. <laughs> the room was filled with guards. This man is unhinged. This man no is unhinged. Way. He's absolutely unhinged, but he is the most entertaining character of the entire series, or mm. at least this book, because he's so unhinged. Okay, yeah. and that's supposed to be hot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody moves, nobody screams. Warner drops his gun on Juliet's empty plate. Choose your words wisely, Juliet. One word from me and your life here won't be so easy. Adam pushes a plate of food in front of Juliet and she's looking at him and she can't really decipher his emotions, but one thing is very clear. He's asking her to eat. He's not demanding it of her. He's asking for everyone's sake, please eat. So that's what Juliet does. She eats, and Warner smirks. Do I have to get Adam to do all my work for me? It seems like he's the only one that you'll listen to. Oddly, Julia can tell that it bothers him, 
that she only listens to Adam, okay? And after dinner, Warner insists on walking Juliet back to her room. Not that she can protest much after what happened at dinner, but he's like, Juliet, I don't want you to hate me. I'm only your enemy if you want me to be. If you're with the reestablishment, we will always be enemies. I'm never gonna be what you want me to be. We could be unstoppable, you know? I think you'll change your mind. Why don't you sleep on it? Also, side note, if you're wondering why Juliet doesn't touch anyone and everyone, you know, to get the hell out of here, because I'd be like, give me your face. I'd be touching everybody and then leaving. Mm -hmm. She's a bit of a moral crusader. She wants to do what's right. She's willing to subject herself to the torture of some hot dudes if that means she's being morally upstanding. That is not my favorite trait in a main character, uh. but it's a common one in the YA category. I mean, some people do it a little bit better than others. For the first book at least, okay, please don't hate me. Maybe it gets better. But for the first book, She's just kind of insufferable. Mm. Just a little, but at least she's not dumb. At mm. least she's not dumb. The worst is when they're so morally upstanding and they're so <laughs> dumb. And I'm like, bro, bro, you cannot right now. You cannot be serious. You're just so dumb waiting for a prince to come save you and you like care about ethics. Just save your damn life. I'm so sick of this. Shit. At least Juliet is not dumb, okay? She's smart, but she's got like a really strong moral compass. And it's almost to the point where it makes her a one-dimensional character. Mm -hmm. It's like she, I know what she's gonna do already because mm -hmm. she's just gonna do what's right. And there's not really like this inner turmoil of like, but I wanna do what's wrong. In the hallway together, as they're walking to her room, the hallway is filled with guards, by the way, so that's great. As they're walking, Juliet asks Warner for his first name. And he's like, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. You already know my name. Let me rephrase that. What I meant to say was, I'll tell you mine if you show me yours. What? Show me what you can do. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna touch you. That's okay, I don't need your help. He starts taking off his gloves, Juliet screams and books it down the hall, and yeah, yeah. Okay? Wait, 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 wait. He what? just wants to feel the torture for a second. Because she can let go without killing someone. It's what? just like they hold on for too long. And so he says, fine, you don't want to hurt me. I'm so flattered. But she keeps running. She slows down a bit, and she hears Warner say, Jenkins, another soldier. Juliet watches as a guard stands at attention and bows his head. Sir, I'm going to need you to accompany Mrs. Miss Ferris back downstairs. But be warned, she's going to try and break free from your grip. No matter what she says, no matter what happens, you cannot let go of her. Are we clear? Juliet can see the fear in Jenkins' eyes. He knows. He knows what's going to happen if he touches her. But he nods and starts running after Juliet anyway. She's <laughs> booking it down the hallway. What is this? Juliet's world feels like it's spinning. Jenkins catches up with her and steps forward, and she squeezes her eyes shut. And when she looks up, Jenkins is grabbing her arm and has a face full of fear and regret. He is not wearing gloves. The minute that they make contact, Jen Jenkins screams, Bloody murder. And Juliet feels alive. She hates herself for feeling this way. She wishes it hurt her as much as it hurt everybody else, but she honestly kind of likes it. And she hates herself that her body likes it. But whenever someone touches her, it feels like she's sucking the life out of them into her. It's like that good old vampire. Like, yes. Oh, I don't want to hurt humans, but ooh, it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like the pleasure that she never asked for. And once that contact is made, for whatever reason, Jenkins cannot let go of her. It's like he's super glued onto her. The only person that can break that contact is Juliet, mm -hmm. which is why it takes so long to finally let Jenkins go. She hopes that nobody notices her hesitation, okay? So she lets go of him and looks down to see him shriveled up in a fetal position on the floor in pain. And tears are just streaming down her face and she's screaming, Please, somebody help him! Help him! All the other guards are frozen as if they think Jenkins is somehow contagious now. Juliet is hysterical. She's on the ground before Warner finally scoops her up in his arms. He's wearing gloves and clothes, okay? Screams at Adam and Curtis to help Jenkins. Juliet doesn't know what happens next because she knocks out from, I don't know, exhaustion. She wakes up in the middle of the night from a nightmare and all she sees was Jenkins' face in pain. She wakes up screaming and sees Warner standing in front of her. He says, at least you're awake. I was worried for a second there. She's upset. Get away from me. I hate you. So much passion. I brought you food. Juliet looks around and she sees that she's not in her room. This room is a bit grander, more opulent. Where am I? My bedroom. I knew it. <laughs>
<laughs> what? Well, take me back to my room. I don't want to be here. Warner offers Juliet a glass of water, and it's confusing. Here he is, caring for her comfort levels after he forced her to nearly kill someone. She feels like she's losing her mind. Personally, I don't think it's that hard of a concept to grasp, but okay. <laughs> and she says, or he says, you fainted. Probably had too much excitement on your first day. My mistake. Why are you being so nice to me right now? Bro, what is going on? Bro. Uh, Bro. It's like talks like a 17-year-old couple. <laughs> <laughs> Which they are. I don't know. Okay, the dialogue, at least from Juliet's perspective, is very forced. Like, he's not really being that nice to you. Like, you know why he's being nice to you, because he wants you to be an asset to your team. Yeah, like, yeah. these are very easy concepts to understand. But she's like, you almost made me kill someone, but, like, you're offering me a glass of water. I'm so confused. Who are you? Like, are you a good person or not a good person? And it's like, what is going on right now? What are you saying, girl? Get it together. I'm going to need you to be a little bit quicker up here. Anyway, she's like, why are you being so nice to me right now? <laughs> <laughs> for a glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, because I care about you. And she almost spits out her water. You care about me? I almost killed Jenkins because of you. You threaten me. You keep me prisoner. Give me no freedom. And you can say that you care about me? You're a freaking monster. You know that? I'm only trying to help you, Juliet. <laughs> well, you're a liar. Yes, most of the time. Just let me go. I'm never going to be your experiment. Sorry, I can't do that. Why not? Because I need you to. You need me to kill people, and I'm never going to do that. Juliet, I'm very capable of killing people on my own without you. I'm actually very good at it, so I don't need you to kill people for me. Well, you disgust me. You kill people for power. As do you, Juliet. How dare you? No, I don't. Feel free to lie to yourself if it helps you sleep better at night. But why did you take so long to break contact with Jenkins? Why didn't you fight back right away? Why did you allow him to touch you for as long as he did? You know nothing about me. Warner smirks and he turns towards the door. He calls out behind him, eat something, then go to sleep and I'll be back for you in the morning. Why can't I sleep in my own room? Because I want you here. Good night, Juliet. And he leaves, okay? Now, out of pure hatred, Juliet wants to stay awake, but she collapses out of pure exhaustion and falls asleep in Warner's bed. She dreams about the first day that she thought about ending her life. Yeah, so like we get these flashbacks to when she was a kid and she was being bullied for touching people and torturing them. And it was just, you know, she just always had hope that things would get better. The next morning she wakes up and Warner is sitting at the foot of the bed in a pristine new suit, looking well rested. She felt very uncomfortable, right? And she felt finally relieved when he told her she could go back to her room. She gets up, opens the door, and there are so many guards on this level. There are even more soldiers than are on her floor. And each one of them has like four different types of guns strapped to them and they look terrified of her. They all grip their weapons a bit tighter as she walks by, and Warner seems very pleased with himself. This will all work in your favor, Juliet. What? I don't want them to be afraid of me. You should. If they don't fear you, they're gonna hunt you. People hunt things that they fear all the time. At least now they'll know what they're up against. Did you do that on purpose? You made me do what I did to Jenkins on purpose? Everything I do is on purpose. I was trying to protect you. From your soldiers? They reach the elevators, and Warner doesn't respond until they get inside and the doors close. Yes, from my own soldiers. You still have a lot to learn, Juliet. Power and control can slip from your grasp at any moment, even when you think that you're prepared. They're not easy to earn, they're even harder to retain. You think that I don't know many of my own soldiers hate me? You think I don't know how many of them would relish if I ever fell? You are a threat to everyone in this building. They have every reason to want to harm you. Can't you see that I'm trying to help you? Juliet loses her marbles. She's like, you're trying to help me by hurting me? By hurting other people? How is that trying to help me? Warner smirks at her and he looks genuinely disgusted by her. And he says, go back to your room, wash up and change. Juliet is about to protest, but standing at attention in front of her room door is Adam and he looks badly beaten. So Warner had hurt Adam as a way of getting back at Juliet for for basically not eating and also her outburst at dinner, but also not wearing the purple dress. I don't know. And for his sake, Juliet is now wearing whatever dress he picks out all the time. She grabs the purple dress for dinner that day and she goes into the bathroom to change and she's about to put it on but she feels something heavy in the dress pocket. She reaches inside. It's her notebook. Adam had smuggled in her notebook. She takes it out. She's scanning through the pages and in the very back, there's a new line that's clearly not her handwriting and it just reads, it's not what you think. 
so gripped it for what? Yeah, Juliet feels her heart racing. Like, it's not what I think. Like, what does that mean? He's not part of the reestablishment. Is she going crazy? Like, what's going on? She rushes to put on the dress and meets Warner for dinner. And she's confronting him. You hurt Adam. You shouldn't care, but obviously you do. Warner leads Juliet outside, which she makes it a point not to look too happy, but she can't help it. She hasn't been outside in like three years. The smell of fresh air is euphoric, even though it's very polluted. Warner pulls out his gun and leads her out to the courtyard where there are thousands of soldiers lined up in uniform. They're standing. Okay, so Warner and Juliet are standing on a platform that's like 15 feet tall and they can see everyone standing at attention. There's almost 50 rows of soldiers, perfectly spaced. That's like thousands of soldiers. They're waiting for something. They're waiting for Warren or Warner. He walks up to the mic and starts speaking through it. Sector 45. He reaches for Juliet with his gloved hand. We have two matters to deal with. The first one is standing by my side. Jenkins, step forward. Jenkins looks petrified, but he steps forward. <laughs> Jenkins had the pleasure of meeting Juliet last night. I hope you all greet her with the same kindness. She will be with us for some time. The reestablishment welcomes her. I welcome her. And you should welcome her. The soldiers do this elaborate bow that takes like 15 steps in complete uniformity to do it at the same pace. And it, it puts Juliet on edge. They only get up once Warner commands them to. Good. The second matter at hand is even more pleasant. Delilu has a report for us. And a man is shaking and he steps forward. There has been a breach. Soldier 45B 76423 was found in unregulated grounds with civilians that are believed to be rebel party members. So he turns to the new soldier. Seamus, do you deny these accusations? No, sir. Warner shoots him straight in the forehead without even flinching. Nobody moves, they all freeze. Every soldier falls to one knee before it being dismissed. Juliet follows Warner back inside and she's whining at him. You killed him! You just killed him! Great observation skills, Juliet. Why did you just kill him? How could you just kill him like that? She gets in his face and she's like, you disgust me. Warner calmly grabs her face with his gloved hands. She wants to leave, but she's hypnotized by his face. And he tells her, the world is a bleak place. Sometimes you have to learn to shoot first. You should probably go to get some sleep. I'll have food sent up to your room. Where's Adam? Why do you care? He's supposed to be watching over me, but he's not here. Does that mean you're going to kill him too? I only kill people I need to. Get some rest. Juliet goes to her empty room. There's no escape. You know, the hallways are lined with guards that she could honestly just touch and get out of there, but fine. And the place is, has impenetrable security. Adam or not, she's staying tonight. She falls asleep and wakes up to another scream coming from her own mouth, another nightmare. Adam is in her face and when she opens her eyes, she's like, what are you doing? You don't need to scream anymore. I'm here. You're safe. What is going on here? Honestly, same. I'm so confused. So like the way that these relationships progress yeah. was kind of giving me like fever dream vibes. Because like suddenly she's attached to Adam again and then suddenly Adam is like, you're safe, I'm here. A bitch. What are you going to protect me from? How are you going to protect me? Don't be saying that if you can't protect me. But he'll be saying it and it's just like really weird. Yeah, the dialogue is also very um like sporadic. And I feel like no one's actually talking to each other. <laughs> it's kind of weird. That's the vibe I was getting. Like, no one was actually talking to each other. Maybe this book is so much deeper than you thought. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I think I'm dumb because I don't get it. <laughs> I imagine if I woke up screaming from a nightmare, I'd be, I wouldn't be like, what are you doing here? I'd be like, oh my god, I just had a nightmare. <laughs> That's crazy. And then I don't expect you to be like, you don't need to scream anymore. I'm here. <laughs> You're safe. I'd be like, that doesn't make sense because a nightmare, it doesn't matter who's here. I'm going to have a fucking nightmare. It's in my brain, you idiot. I'd be like, that's weird. That doesn't make any sense. We're getting married in two months. And part of me is like, you know, it'd be super cute if I did a portion of my vows in Mandarin because his family is going to be there. They speak Mandarin and I don't. And I've always wanted to be closer to him, to his family, to his culture. And Chinese is, from my personal opinion, one of the hardest languages to learn ever. But Rosetta Stone 
has been saving my life, okay? I tell you, even for Korean. My fiance is learning Korean right now on Rosetta Stone, I convinced him. I sometimes do it with him because I'm terrified of forgetting my Korean. If you guys don't know, Rosetta Stone is the expert in language learning for 30 years. They have this award-winning app where you can learn the language of your choice anytime, anywhere. Like their app is so user-friendly. I love how easy it is to pick up these lessons in these bite-sized pieces. It doesn't feel like you're climbing this mountain every day to learn a language. It just truly takes 10 minutes of your time as I'm learning I feel like it's fun okay it's kind of satisfying because I do the 10 minutes and then at the end I'm like wait a minute I know Mandarin now it's so satisfying to see the progress and it's fun because none of it is like focused on memorization and vocab you have 25 languages to choose from so Spanish French Italian Korean Chinese Japanese Arabic these are just to name a few so many choices and it's legit Sometimes you learn languages on these types of apps and you sound super formal, like you don't sound like a local. My fiance was looking over my shoulder while I was doing my little lesson and he's like, that's actually surprising. Like the pronunciation and the way that they phrase the sentence is literally how locals would say it, which is incredible. So Rosetta Stone, they go beyond just vocabulary. They focus on speaking practice, pronunciations. I also love that it doesn't feel like I'm learning. Is that bad? But it doesn't feel like I'm there, like trying to memorize random words and sentence structures. It's actually fun. And we're hoping to go to China at the end of the year. So it's very exciting that I'm learning Mandarin. I also think when someone knows more than one language, it's just so attractive. So right now for a limited time, our listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime unlimited subscription, which gives you access to all 25 of their languages forever for 40% off. Visit rosettastone.com baking today. Rosetta Stone, how language is learned. Anyway, the two go to the bathroom to wash up where there's no cameras. Juliet sees him take off his shirt. He's covered in bruises. But he also has a tattoo of a bird. Anyway, he's like, Juliet, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, all of this is not. I know, I found the note. Adam looks relieved and Juliet is about to say something, but he stops her. There's no cameras in the bathroom, but we don't know if there's like audio recorders. So he turns on the shower full blast. They frantically look around and he hoists her inside the shower, literally throws her in the shower in a hot, steamy way, which I didn't find that hot, but like it was supposed to be very hot and steamy. And there's steam, the mirrors are fogged up, they can barely hear each other. And Adam pins her up against the wall and she looks down <laughs> Look down, where? Oh, I'm sorry, no. no. He's touching her! Touching her where? Like, on the arms with his bare hands. Oh, you can't say that. Oh, sorry. Make it clear. Okay, sorry. And he's like, I can touch you? What are you doing? <laughs> that bro. Adam is anxious, but he continues. I didn't understand until the other night. He pulls her in closer, and Juliet is basically drunk on the touch that she's been craving for years. For once, she can touch someone without killing them. She can't understand it, but she's in love. He's running her ha his hands up and down her. The other night, the first night in the cell, you were screaming in your sleep, and I touched your face. I just wanted to wake you up from your nightmare. What? That's not, that's not possible. I'm gonna get you out of here, Juliet. I am. They're basically dry humping in the shower at this point. And I guess it's not that dry, but Juliet wants to pinch herself. They both can't stop smiling, and she looks down to see the tattoo of the bird on his chest. The same bird she has in her dreams. It's on him. And it takes everything in Juliet to not touch Adam every chance she gets now, now that she knows that they can touch each other. For the first time since stepping into this compound, she feels hope. She wants to fight for the future because she can touch a boy. <laughs> Listen getting real heterosexual in here, okay? <laughs> it's getting too heterosexual. Like, I'm straight, but this is a little too straight, okay? <laughs> okay, so she just wants to get better for Adam, for her. But every day until then, Juliet has to entertain Warner and join him for dinner and wear his dresses and listen to him talk about the reestablishment. She was scared that any little thing that would, I don't know, give away her status, relationship status with Adam. She was scared Adam was gonna get in trouble again. These marshmallows are making me nauseous. The smell is so sickly sweet right now. Warner tries everything to get Juliet on his side. Oddly, he wants her to want to be with him, to join him in a sick mission. So he becomes more possessive, more trying to be more convincing and all of that. He's trying to be like, I'll give you power, I promise. I'll give you this and that and this and that. Okay, if Wait, you has feel- he, Has he explained why he wants her so bad yet? 
basically to like torture people. But he already said he could torture people without her. Yeah, can I just say something? I think the man's just fascinated by her and like probably wants to just, I don't know, I don't know, like sleep with her or something, honestly. <laughs> that's the vibe I'm getting. Second of all, if you feel like I'm like brushing through everything, if you feel like I'm like not giving you the details that you're asking for, if you feel like I'm just like, any, anyway, Warner was like this, and then she was like this, and then this happened, and then this happened, I'm not, I'm not. The book was very spacey, like there's no, um, like, it's just like, all of a sudden I was transported to dinner and then they have two seconds of dialogue and then Juliet is like in her feels and then I'm transported back to her room where she's in her feels and trying to make out with Adam. And I'm like, Tankaman, what's going on right now? Maybe I'm not straight enough for this book is how I felt. That's how I felt. I don't think I'm straight enough for this book because like, if this is a dystopian future, I don't think I just, I just really didn't like Adam. He's such a bland person. He's mm. like a golden retriever character, but not even in the good way. Mm. Like just so surface level boring that I'm like, really? You want to give up your life for this dude right here? <laughs> this like powerless dude? Like you can kill people. You can touch him and kill him and he's got no powers. And you're like, that's the one. I want to give up my life for him. I will never understand. Then we go through all the dinners of Warner being like, join me, I can tell you. I can give you power. The world has rejected you. I can make them fear you, blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, no, I'll never be the monster you want me to be. Can you take the cameras out of my room, please? <laughs> really? So she somehow convinces him to take the cameras out of her room, but they have a bargain. He wants her to touch him. He wants to feel what she's capable of doing. And she, I mean, this guy is evil. This is literally everything you hate in a reestablishment, right, Juliet? Yeah. Correct? But he's like too hot to kill, right? So she's like, no, I, I won't do it. I won't do it. I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> so then he's like, I'm going to get my end of the bargain. Anyway, she goes to her room. The cameras are disabled. She's basically just f***ing at him every chance that she can get. And I'm like, get it together. Focus. Wait, wait, they're doing it? I don't know if they're doing it. I skimmed through it. It was kind of bland. But he's bland. Listen, I hear everything gets so good when she ends up with Warner. Cause let's be real, she's gonna end up with Warner, okay? And I heard that, that is when it's hot, it's juicy. The chemistry is flying off the charts, but with this puppy dog, Adam, it's just not doing it for me. It's not doing it, I don't understand the appeal. So once they get back into the room, Adam and Juliet, they're touching each other with the disabled cameras. Adam has the bird tattoo that she's obsessed over. She's like literally drunk off of the touch. On one perspective, I can understand that she's been craving human contact for so long and to have someone physically crave her must be a good feeling. But on the other hand, get it together. This is too hetero, get it together. We cannot be giving up our lives for a, a dumb guy, okay? It's just. It's too much. And then he tells her he loves her out of nowhere. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on right now? And then he's like, of course I remember you, Juliet, from middle school. I would never forget you. <laughs> and I'm like, Tankaman, Tankaman, what's going on right now? Are we in a dystopian world where everything is going to shit or not? This was one of my favorite parts about Six of Crows. There was a lot of romantic storylines, right? But not once, not once, gun to their heads were they like, let's kiss first. Like when times were tense, they tried to keep the romance lines at a minimum because that's realistic. But this one, it's like this. And they're like, I just want to make out with you. <laughs> I'm like, get it together. Get it together. He tells her that he loves her and that she's the nicest human being that he's ever met. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm a monster. And he's like, no, you're not. You're not a monster. Also, there's this really weird storyline where she hasn't seen a mirror in three years. So for the first time, she looks in the bathroom mirror <laughs> and she's beautiful, okay? <laughs> she's beautiful. Like, she's never done skincare. She doesn't have makeup on. She, doesn't, she hasn't seen an eyebrow pencil in 10 years. And she's beautiful. <sighs> Are you salty? <laughs> and then they start planning their escape. But will we ever know what their plan is? No. <laughs> They're just like, we're planning our escape now. We're going to run away. In like three weeks, I think we're going to do it. We're going to run away when there's like a huge little festival, okay? We have no idea what their great escape is going to be. We have no idea what their prison break is going to be. They're just like, let's escape and let's make out. And then they escape. Oh, they did? Yeah, they do. They do. Okay, so for like two weeks, they don't escape. 
It's like another two weeks of dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. That's all. They, all she does. Okay. Can I be honest? I feel like. I feel like the whole video is you. Can I be honest? <laughs> Because I'm sure it gets better. I'm gonna give the second book a chance. <laughs> the whole book. I'm sure it's gonna get better. But can I be honest? <laughs> like Agatar, you know how they constantly had lunch and dinner? Yes, that's yes, what I feel like. It was kind of annoying, but I feel like there were these smaller moments and like conversations where it did pique my interest. Like she would overhear things, like she would eavesdrop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was like the blight. Yeah. And then there were these animals or people. There were a lot of people that was yeah. going on. But here are just nameless, faceless guards. And then her and two dudes. And they're all like, so far, I'm not really digging it so far. Mm -hmm. Like out of everyone, I do think I dig Warner the most. Because mm -hmm. he's like kind of like this psychopathic hottie, which is like, Cool. Only in books, not in real life. We have a different channel for that now, but but it was just it was kind of weird. It's just so much dinner, <laughs> so much. I felt like I was stuck at a dinner party that I didn't want to be at. And I'm like, why am I here right now? <laughs> anyway, anyway, she's like his arm candy, right? She wears these stupid dresses, goes to the dinners. He treats her like some trophy he's gonna win. <sighs> A hundred pages later. The end. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Do you want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> I have my pickles about this book. I have my pick. You know what the problem was? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it gets better, but can I be honest? Everyone was hyping it up. They were like, the romance duo of the century. Aaron Warner and Juliet. Shatter Me series shattered my heart. Couldn't it wear? Where did it happen? It's not in this one. It's not in this one. So like my expectation was here and maybe if I finish the whole series, it'll be closer. But after the first book, I'm like... <laughs> anyway, Adam tells Juliet that Warner is obsessed with her. I don't know. It's like a hobby. <laughs> He's like obsessed. He wants her to want to be with him in a way, you know, but he seems like he's losing it. That's what Adam says. Adam says he seems unhinged. Whenever he's around you, he's two seconds away from losing his edge. He's paranoid one second, then he's patient, then impatient, he's unstable. The next day, Warner comes into the room and demands Juliet put on a special outfit for him. The skimpiest outfit in the world. Not only is the fabric super thin, but it barely covers her body. And listen, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people have problems with Akatar. It's not literary masterpiece, okay? It's just, it's kind of a guilty pleasure book. But you know, when Rissand is like putting her into these skimpy outfits, there's like levels of the humiliation and seeing um, Tamlin looking at her, there's like all these levels. And then I feel like this happens in this book, but she's like, here, put on this skanky little outfit. For no reason. And then she's like, stop, fine. I guess I must because I'm gonna escape soon, but I'm not gonna tell anybody how we're escaping. Okay, anyway. She wants to just throw on a sweater, but he won't let her, so that's great. Adam isn't following them anymore. She has no idea where she's going to go with the skimpy little outfit on. And they go into a basement. There's like four security metal doors that they have to get past. It's underground. It's high security level clearance. Juliet's only comfort is knowing that even though basically all the male guards in the building are eyeing her down, she's untouchable. It's her only saving grace. Anyway, Warner leads her into a room where he locks the door behind her. She's completely alone, and it looks like a cell. It looks more like a back room, honestly. Uh, yellow walls, carpet, the color of dead grass. It's just not a pleasant place. And one of the walls is taken up by this giant mirror, probably one-way glass. Warner is watching her right now, and she waits for what feels like forever until she hears these loud mechanical noises. The ground that she's standing on starts shaking. The ceiling starts shaking and it's just pure chaos. There's metal spikes that protrude from the walls, the ground, the ceiling, just everywhere, randomly. You can't really pinpoint a system. You just have to hope that you're lucky enough not to be in the way when one of them comes out. It's a torture chamber. Warner's voice comes out on the speakers. Are you ready? Juliet has no idea what she's supposed to be ready for, but the door clicks open and a little boy walks in, terrified. He's sobbing, he's blindfolded. Warner's voice comes back on. If you don't save him, we won't either. Juliet looks down. She's barely clothed. There's no way for her to save this child without hurting him too. Because it's not like she's wearing a lot of fabric so she can like take off her clothes and like pick him up or something. It's just going to be very, very difficult. <sighs> the walls start moving. Juliet doesn't have time to think. She rushes for the kid, grabs him up, and hears him screaming, bloody murder. He's kicking to be let down. He's in so much pain. It's really, I don't know why. 
Yo, what's going on? What's what's the purpose of this? No purpose? No purpose. The oh. spikes disappear once more and Juliet puts him down. He's paralyzed in pain and then it happens again. She has to pick him up again. And Warner's voice comes back on and he's like, absolutely amazing. Brilliant love. I'm thoroughly impressed. The walls start moving again and Juliet braces to basically torture the child once more. She knows if he runs blindfolded into a spike, he's as good as dead. But if she touches him for too long, he's as good as dead. What a pickle to be in. I was in a pickle of my own. Reading this book. <laughs> She's seething with rage. The fact that Warner could make her do something like this. He would dispose of a child's life like it meant nothing. In a burst of anger, Juliet decides Warner had to die. She runs towards the one-way mirror, the concrete walls, slams her fist into the wall like a Hulk. It disintegrates. <laughs> wait, wait, she broke the, gl broke the glass? Oh. And the concrete. And the concrete. Yeah. Oh. She grabs, she jumps on Warner, grabs his collar, and drags him onto the ground. All the guards are holding their rifles at her. And he's like, don't you dare shoot her. <laughs> Juliet doesn't even care. She sees red. I should kill you. You just broke through concrete with your bare hands. Guards, stand down. If you hurt her, I'll shoot you myself. Stand down. Juliet snaps back to reality, and all the rage that she once felt is gone. So anyways, she just feels confused. Did she burst through a wall or what? She had no idea what she just did. She starts shaking, trembling, and Warner is looking at her with pure excitement in his eyes. And then she's just like allowed back to her room where she collapses in the shower and like Adam is making out with her. That's it. What? Yeah, that's like it for that part. And then okay. at one point he tells her, oh, oh my God. He's like, I'm never going to let this happen to you again. I love you. And she goes, how could you possibly care about someone like me? <laughs> and he says, because I'm in love with you. Which, side note, if you don't like main characters who have no idea that they're drop-dead gorgeous, have self-esteem issues when they have literal magical powers, and they verbally say, how could you love someone like me? This is the book for you. And although, although I myself have raging self-esteem issues that I'm currently talking to a therapist about, I'm kind of in my girl power era. Where I want to read about leads who are like, you know what? You can stick around because I'm feeling generous. But I'll kill you. Like, that's what I'm looking for. But she's not giving that. So it was a pleasant, unpleasant surprise. Anyway, so after she inadvertently tortures a literal child, they're making out in the shower. And let me give you a quote. It's not smutty, by the way. It's just a little bit descriptive. Like, the way that they engage in activity so far. It's definitely not Court of Mist and Fury smutty. It's not even Lauren Asher smutty. So here's a direct quote. He grabs my hands, lifts my arms, one over my head, and pins me against the wall, kissing me till I'm sure I'm dreaming, drinking in my lips with his lips. He tastes like rain and sweet musk, and I'm about to explode. The intensity of our bodies could shatter these glass walls. It nearly does. Listen, I want you to describe the outline of his abs. I don't want this. I don't want to know he tastes like rainwater. I don't know what that means. I want to know how many packs are we talking. That's what I wanted. So anyways, it goes on like that for a while. They get out and Juliet rushes to get dressed because Warner is expecting her for dinner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> Wait, can I just sum up the rest real quick? Sum it up? <laughs> What's in it? <laughs> so basically they So basically <laughs> So basically he finds the notebook. He finds the notebook in her little pocket in uh -huh. her dress because she was so busy looking at the mirror. Uh -huh. She's like, I haven't uh -huh. seen myself in three uh -huh. years. She forgot that she had the notebook in her pocket. Uh-huh. And he's like, What is this? And he's gonna kill Adam for it, probably, because he knows that she's not the one that smuggled it in. And then at the same time, simultaneously, code seven alarms go off and all the soldiers are reported to go downstairs and meet with their commanding officer, including Adam. So Warner comes into Juliet's room and is like, don't worry, I got you. Wait, why are they escaping? They this haven't... is the escape. Oh, oh God. The alarms are going off, so all the guards are gone. Adam uh -huh. comes back, even though he's not supposed to. He's supposed to be with his commanding officer, right? Yeah. He comes back and they tie up Warner and they jump out the window. But at the very last second, Warner unties himself and he grabs for Juliet's arms with his bare hands uh -huh. and nothing happens. He can touch her too. 
Why? <laughs> How? They don't tell you. So oh. then Juliet and Adam, they're on the run. Okay, they run, they run, they run. Nothing really happens as they run. There's just like gunshots somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's not like this intense. There were moments where I'm like on the edge of my seat. Te technically, this is supposed to be the moment where I'm like reading super fast, and I know that I get very anxious in scenes like this. So I like super speed read. I'm like skimming through. I'm like, I just need to know nobody dies, nobody dies, nobody dies. I did not have that. I was chillaxing. I was eating grapes. I'm like, so they're running. They hear gunshots. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's cool. I just hope nobody gets shot. But if they do, I guess I'm not that invested right now. <laughs> so anyway, they're running, they're running around, and then he's like, I'm gonna take you home, baby. She's like, you have a home? They go home. Adam oh, has a home where he has a 10-year-old... Yeah. Real estate. <laughs> Real estate. He has a 10-year-old brother named James, who's like a smart ass, and it's just like very, um, it's very cliche. He's like, nice to meet you, I'm James, and she's... <gasps> And then he's like, just kidding. He already told me about you. He talks about you all the time. I know I can't touch you. <laughs> That's cute. And yeah, and then she's like, oh my god, I really want his little brother to like me. And then his little brother is like, Adam, I'm so glad you're home. Can you never leave again? So they're just like at home, basically, for having dinner. <laughs> Having dinner at home. And then all of a sudden, the next day, there's a knock on the door. They're like, oh, he found us. But then Adam is like, no, if it was Warner, he wouldn't be knocking. Mm -hmm. So they open the door, and it's a fellow soldier named um, Kenji. And Kenji has been shot. And Kenji was like Adam's best friend. So he was tortured. The, the Warner tortured him for information on where Adam would go. He mm -hmm. managed to escape, and now he's here. And Adam's like, how are you here? It's like a whole useless story of why he's here. Uh -huh. But he's like, I know a place. I know a place where the rebels hang out. We need to go there. It's a hideout. So mm -hmm. they get all their stuff. They wait for James, the little kid, to come home from school because, you know, propaganda school. And they get into, um, they leave the apartment. They're under attack. Literally, the minute that they leave, Warner has found them. He's shooting at them. There's like a whole chase and run. They got to get to a car. It's like this whole thing. Adam gets shot. Warner throws Juliet into a room and he's like, now I know I can touch you. He starts touching wait, wait, her all wait, over wait, the place. Wait, 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 hold up. Slow yeah. down. Oh, okay. He caught her. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was quick. Yeah, so then Warner is like putting her in this room, touching her all over the place. Unconsensually, my add. And Juliet notices that there's a gun in his pocket, but she needs to unclothe him to get it. So she plays into it. She starts making out with him. Sneaky little girl. Okay, <laughs> sneaky, sneaky. It's not cheating if your life is on the line. Okay. <laughs> so then she starts making out with him, taking off his clothes, takes out the gun, and he's like, <gasps> and then she aims it, but she misses. He's not dead, but he's on the ground. He's bleeding. So then she leaves and she finds Adam, saves him. They steal a car. There's this whole banana bit where they find a banana in the car. Adam is like badly wounded. He's gonna die. And then she's like, oh, I've only ever heard of bananas. Really? I heard they're high in potassium. There's literally a sentence where she talks about the potassium in bananas. <laughs> and then she gives it to him and he eats it. And then he recovered. <laughs> no, no, it's not a magical <laughs> banana. And then uh, they pick up Kenji and James who are hiding. They get to the rebel place, which is called Omega Point. And it's underground. It's like high security. It's like super high tech. It's like really intense. Okay. Kenji has powers. Kenji's like Jesper. He's like the cool friend, the funny comedic effect friend. He has mm -hmm. powers. He can be invisible. What? Yeah, so everyone in this rebel compound has a lot of powers. So Juliet is welcomed. And the leader, his name is Castle. And they're planning for something big. What is going on? Yeah. But like, I just want you to know, I barely summarized. Oh, that is how it went. That's basically how it went. Uh. And like, usually my problems with bands is I don't want to leave any detail out. And so they end up being yeah. 10 hours long. Yeah. But this one, I'm like, basically that's what happens, really. <laughs> Gun to my head. <laughs> well, you can read it yourself. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> For dinner. <laughs> Be my dinner guest. And like the whole time at the rebel compound, all Juliet is thinking about is running her hands all over Adam again. And I'm just like, I'm so over this. Like, I think I don't want to be straight anymore after this book. I genuinely don't want to be straight anymore. Why have you done this to me? The end of the book is all of them being like a happy hee hee ha family in the rebel compound. 
And they find out that Warner is alive and Warner is planning an attack on the rebel compound, but that's what they want. Dun, dun, dun. I genuinely wanted to save all of my thoughts for the afterward, right? Because I just, I'm so scared. This series has a cult following and like I said, I'm sure it gets better, right? I think the book was an easy read. There was no part where I wanted to throw it at the wall, throw it at the window or stop reading. Like there was no part where I was like, ugh. I think the whole thing was, I was just kind of waiting for something to happen. I was just like waiting and waiting. But then it's crazy because I look back and I'm like, wait, I feel like a lot of things did happen. Technically, there wasn't an insane asylum, then they broke out of the, uh, they, there were so many breakthroughs and then rebels, but it just, I don't know. So the writing style is a hit or miss for people. Some people praise it for being unique. I don't think that it meshed with me. I think that's like a personal taste. I don't think it has anything to do objectively if this book is good or bad. Maybe I also, I just had way too many high expectations going in. So the book itself was an easy read, but I never um, found myself emotional. I never found myself at the edge of my seat. Or you know that feeling with fantasy or YA books or dystopian books? The best part is you get so sucked into this world where you're like, oh my god, this world is amazing. You keep reading, you read, and then you it hit the end and you look up and you're like, I'm so sad. I connected so much with this world, with these characters. I want to be in there. And now you feel out of touch with reality. I didn't have that at all. Like I know some books are bigger than others, but I didn't have that at all. Yeah. And the descriptions for how the events were taking place were so emotional. So like something would happen and it's told from Juliet's perspective. So instead of even setting the scene of being like, you know, I walk into this room and then describing the emotions of people, it's like, I feel upset. Mm -hmm. I feel this, I feel that. So it was very hard to like imagine and picture it in my head. Mm -hmm. They're just where, and everything is like a metaphor in this book. Like it's very poetic. You know what it reminds me of? Spoken word poetry is how this book is written. Mm -hmm. Yes, which I, I mean, some people love it. Oh my God, they die hard for that type of writing. I thought it was okay, yeah. <laughs> I wish the characters were more dimensional. So far it seems like Warner is the only one where I'm kind of intrigued of like, oh, I'd like to know who his parents were, like how he got into this position of power. Like, what's his deal? What's his obsession with Juliet? Like, I'm sure he's got a lot of flaws. But the other ones, they were a little one-dimensional. Juliet, I feel like she did not get the justice she deserved. Like, I wanted to know about when it first started. The first time she touched someone, and it was like pure terror. But instead, every time we got a flashback to her, her childhood trauma, it was just always like, I never wanted to hurt people. I never wanted this. Well, like, no sh I don't think anyone wants that, okay? Oh my God, am I getting heated? I'm sorry. <laughs> so I just wish there was more of that, you know? And uh, it's interesting, like I can still picture every scene in my mind, but it wasn't like rich imagery. It was just very plain. I feel like I almost took from other books. Mm. Like I'm like, oh, there was one point like Juliet's room. Mm -hmm. I just used the room from Akatar. Mm. I was like, whatever. Because I, I wasn't given like a, a picture of it. Mm. Right? So anyway, the writing style is very, very poetic and maybe I'm too dumb to get into it. So there is a very controversial quote in this book. Some people love it for the artsiness. Others hate it for how overly metaphorical this book makes everything be. Also, this book has a lot of strike throughs. There's one page that's just, I'm not insane, I'm not insane, and it's just strike through. I always wonder about raindrops. I wonder about how they're always falling down, tripping over their own feet breaking their legs and forgetting their parachutes as they tumble right out of the sky towards an uncertain end. It's like someone is emptying their pockets over the earth and doesn't seem to care where the contents fall. Doesn't seem to care that the raindrops burst when they hit the ground, that they shatter when they fall to the floor, that people curse the days the drops dare to tap on their doors. I am a raindrop. Drop top. <laughs> <laughs> My parents emptied their pockets of me and left me to evaporate on a concrete slab. Once or twice I find that that's okay, but this was like basically the whole book. Oof. And it was very like, it's always just her. She was like, I am misunderstood. I'm a monster. <laughs> I'm a monster who doesn't deserve love. I just want to be touched. Please tell me that Juliet becomes more likable, guys, because she's a tiny bit insufferable. She's not dumb, which I hate in a female lead. Dumb and pretty is the worst, okay? We're just waiting for Prince Charming to save her. But she's so morally upstanding, it's exhausting. It's exhausting being in her brain. I'm tired. I want to go, I don't know, steal a pack of gum now because I was so morally upstanding. I'm like, I need some crime in my life. 
I need to go slap your butt when you're not looking or something because this is redonkulous. Uh. Anyway, don't hate me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Man. Don't hate me. I think this is, you know what this is? This is a fantastic beach read. I don't think you can read Six of Crows on the beach. I don't mm. think so, because it's so distracting. There's people running about, there's so much going on, and you're like trying to read Six of Crows, and it's like this intense fantasy world, and you're like, oh my god, my brain. But this is like, you could really, just like a page, put it down, get right back into it, put it down, get right back into it. There's people screaming, you don't need to like focus too hard. Is that a compliment, honey? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing, I never stopped reading. I didn't DNF wow. it. I didn't DNF it. I did not, do not, fin did not finish it. So it did keep my attention enough that I finished it, but it wasn't like this exhausting experience where I'm like, oh my God, what happens next? Mm. So please don't hate me. Please don't hate crime me. I'm sorry. What? I love you guys. I'm still going to give the second book a chance. Okay, bye. <laughs> I love you. Stay tuned for next week and we will be back with another BAM. Bye.